All right. So I've been looking forward to doing this particular session because I think um, anybody who's done any engineering is inspired by science fiction, but uh, somehow it's not, uh, I don't know, polite for adult engineers to admit it when you're like 14 year olds and you say, I like Asimov stories and I want to build robots like Asimov stories. People um, kind of look self-indulgently at you, but if you're like uh, in your 40s and saying you want to build Asimov robots, it's uh, not as funny. Anyway, I thought uh, as a fun exercise, what happens if you actually take Asimov's uh, three laws of robotics um, seriously and try to apply a version of that kind of thinking to rumors? And if you're not familiar with the three laws, we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, but also we are using Figma. The link is posted in Discord. So feel free to click open and play around, uh, zoom, pan, add comments anywhere. If you're not used to uh, Figma, <coughs> the, this might be fun. I just learned it today, so it was a lot of fun. All right, let's zoom out a little bit. Okay, so big picture, I want to cover basically three topics. So the yellow boxes are uh, basically what kind of inspiration can you get for robotics from uh, science fiction? The purple boxes are specifically about Asimovian robots and uh, how can you like do technical inspiration from them? <laughs> the gray boxes are parts of uh, Asimov robots that are interesting, but maybe not directly relevant to what we're talking about. We can uh, kind of like go down those bunny trails if interested. And then the red ones are actually trying to like apply it somewhat seriously to rovers. And uh, what we'll do is we'll start roughly with the yellow go in a clockwise direction and then end up with the three discussion questions and this little uh, block diagram on the side. So it was, so I kind of wanted to draw like a more formal version of this uh, stack diagram, but I thought it would be more fun to do a whiteboardish. Uh, uh, wipe to this meeting. Okay. All right. Do we have everybody? Let me make sure I know who's there. Fabian. Okay. All right. So let's start with uh, three laws of uh, rovericks. So it's related to the three laws of robotics. We'll get there in a bit. But um, the most basic question is why do you want to do robotics based on something as arbitrary as three laws? And Honestly, my number one answer is fun. It's kind of fun to sort of speculate what happens when you try to do uh, robot design to follow like top level laws. But if you want like more sort of, um, um, I don't know, substantial justifications, three reasons occurred to me. I've been doing a lot of rereading of Asimov's uh, uh, novels and it struck me that it's actually a very good way to do opinionated design. You're giving your robot three top level opinions. If you look into the details of the three laws of Asimov, you realize that there's actually a good angle there on blending uh, old fashioned AI and deep learning and maybe blockchain. We'll get to that. And it also gets to an approach to explainability of AI and uh, robot decisions and actions at higher levels of abstraction. So it's a kind of systematic way, like a robot or AI does something and you ask why it did that. And you say something like, you know, because first law conflicted with second law or something like that. So it's a good kind of explanatory framework if explainability is good for, is important to you. How do you do three laws? Uh, we'll talk about uh, an extremely primitive demo that I'm starting to build as a Rome page. This is, a, we'll get to this towards the end, but I just wanted to flag it there. Well, I should start this timer. Okay. Okay. But let's start kind of like top down breath first. With, um, yeah, fictional robots. So, the question, of course, is what are the interesting and inspiring ones from which you can get uh, engineering you know, inspiration? And at some point, I did a tweet uh, that annoyed a lot of people because everybody was annoyed that I didn't include their favorite robot. But here's my list of 10 interesting robots that I think uh, are interesting. And if you wanna click and see the tweet and replies, that's the tweet link. We'll talk about some of them. 
Okay, but uh, I'll, I'll kind of do the standard history of fictional robots. Uh, there's nothing very unique in my perspective, but if you've not heard some version of this history before, this is the sort of extremely short version. So usually when people ask what's the history of robotics and stories, um, they usually go back to Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, which is kind of like a pre-sci-fi humans build a sort of a sentient being and it kind of goes nuts kind of story. You go further back, uh, the Golem uh, story from uh, Jewish mythology, it's kind of like usually interpreted as a robot kind of story. In fact, if you're interested in Golem's uh, Terry Pratchett's Discworld novels, they feature Golems as a um, character type. So they play a role in plots. And then there's Pinocchio, you can go back to like Greek mythology and stuff. But in my opinion, all these sort of pre-modern sort of proto-robot stories they don't actually have anything of engineering interest to them, like maybe a minor point or two. They're generally only psychologically interesting, not technologically interesting. Related to that, there's a bunny trail, which is if you talk to, I don't know, literally people, postmodern theorists and people in general who kind of like, like to take all the fun out of engineering, they tend to like look at robot stories primarily in terms of like the psychology of what it reveals about the human uh, narrator or storyteller. And this to me is kind of boring. Um, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of literature out there about, you know, how it's like projection and pathological projection, um, narcissist myths, uh, that kind of stuff. And Asimov, actually, one of his contributions was he deliberately set out to reverse this uh, tendency and uh, sort of like flip the Frankenstein script, basically. He said that robots are uh, interesting not as projections of our deepest fears and shit like that. They're interesting simply because it would be very interesting to, to construct those machines. So I sometimes I'm in a mood for the psychology angle on this stuff, but usually I'm not, it annoys me. So that's why I put a little thumbs down. And by the way, if you like or dislike or have any other emotion about any of these points in the presentation, feel free to use the Figma stamps and stuff. Um, you know, it's kind of fun to use. So you can go around annotating uh, this whole Figma. Okay, so we won't go down here. If you want to discuss it, we can later. But let's get straight to actually interesting engineering robots. So if there's a spectrum from like dualistic and kind of disembodied AI plus robot things, and on the other extreme, extremely embodied robots, on one extreme, I think you find the culture minds. So if you haven't read any of Ian M. Banks' culture novels, they're well worth reading. And the premise is there's a galactic civilization. It's kind of like uh, uh, post-scarcity anarchist um, uh, kind of utopia. And the entire society is run by these super human powerful AIs that inhabit spaceship minds. And our own uh, rover naming, uh, project naming, I think most of you know this, but if you didn't, uh, we name our uh, rovers roughly following the template in culture novels. And these are like opinionated names. And in the stories, the uh, minds, as they're called, they pick their own names based on their early experiences and what kind of shaped their personalities. They pick their, what you can think of as true names. So they have memory, they have unique personalities. If you want to look for a particularly good example, my favorite is A Look to Windward. It's one of the best culture novels. And it has, it features a mind that actually inhabits two physical bodies. So when the story is told, it is the mind of an orbiting, uh, what's called an orbital in the culture novels, which is a ring spaced, uh, ring shaped space station where humans live. But before that, thousands of years ago, it was also the mind of what's called a general systems vehicle, which is kind of this extremely capable spaceship. And it was called lasting damage and it played a big role in the Idrian war. And that plays a role, this long, unforgettable memory. So there's a spoiler here. Uh, would anybody object if I revealed it because it's kind of interesting? Or do you want to read the book? Nobody Not cares? just us. It's also people who watch the video. <laughs> oh, <laughs> okay, so I won't... All right, spoiler alert. Skip ahead the next... 30 seconds if you don't want to know. But yeah, so basically um, the mind cannot sort of forget its memory of the war. And 
it's trying to commit suicide throughout the story and it ends up committing suicide as kind of part of its war memories and sadness at having been part of all the violence. So that's kind of like an interesting story of how it's kind of a disembodied dualistic mind that inhabits two bodies, but its memory in an embodied sense is kind of like continuous. So it affects its actions. All right. So kind of gloomy, but very good book. Moving on to another of my favorite robots. Um, Bender is actually a really interesting robot. If you pay careful attention to the Futurama plot, the robots are kind of interesting. And uh, a, lot, a lot of Futurama is kind of like campy, ironic satire on 1950s style science fiction visions and including things like Asimov. So at one point, uh, uh, Fry is afraid that Bender will hurt him. And uh, Bender says something like, I can't hurt you, first law, baby, something like that. But it's clear from like other episodes that Bender has no problems like you know hurting humans. His catchphrase is kill all, kill all humans. But the interesting things about Futurama robots are uh, they, they kind of really emphasize materiality. So a running joke is Bender keeps saying, I'm 40% aluminum, I'm 40% zinc. So he has this catchphrase. Many gags are based on like Bender acting like a physical machine. So at some point he's like a, popcorn machine, he flushes himself like a toilet. So it, it's, he, he also can be kind of disembodied. There's an episode where he kind of like floats off and becomes a ghost. There's another episode where he kind of like goes off into the internet and becomes like this uh, super powered AI. But in general, Bender is a very embodied uh, robot. He's like extremely fond of a shiny metal ass, for example. Uh, and the other robots in the Futurama universe are also kind of similar. They have very strong materially embodied personalities and their minds are very shaped by their bodies. So there's a soda machine uh, a robot that Bender marries at some point. The suicide booth where Bender keeps trying to commit suicide, that is a robot as well. So it, it's kind of fun. And for those who don't like sci-fi robot things, and um, they tend to like the shows like Bojack Horseman, but uh, I think Futurama does the same thing Bojack Horseman does with animals, uh, namely, have fun with the ambiguities of the divide between human and machine. Whereas Bojack Horseman does that between human characters and animal characters, because th there's multiple characters in Bojack Horseman who are like animals, but play kind of human roles. Like Bojack is a famous Hollywood star, but often he'll do weird things that reveal his horse-like nature. So I kind of like that because it's sort of, uh, the moment you slip into thinking of Bojack or Bender as a character that just happens to be in a particular body, they'll say or do something that reminds you that being in that body is actually kind of important. And this, uh, I think Eric added, but uh, yeah. Or uh, who added this? Was it Eric or Anuraj? No, I, I think um, it was Eric. I, I did, I did. Yeah, you want to speak to that, Eric, since you added it? Oh, it's just, um, I really like also the Bender character uh, for the, um, yeah, the, the fun and how it exemplifies how robots can can turn well can turn can turn well or bad okay and so i like this image where basically uh, he's promoting saving the planet and uh, so we can see a lot of robots to save the planet uh, but the method that a bender would uh, um, suggest basically is to kill all the humans okay yep. and so this this kind of irony is uh, I don't know. I like it, and we can see it. It's a theme that we can see a meme. We can see several times. Maybe uh, most of us have seen the the Matrix movie, where in the first one you have, uh, I think, Agent Smith. Okay, basically describing humanity as a, um, comparing humanity to a micro, to a virus, basically. Okay, and so there is this kind of theme uh, that comes again. Oh, perhaps the most famous one is the paper clip. Okay is uh, how to maximize some things by making more paper, paper clips. And so it's just this kind of, um, when we define laws, and I think Asimov uh, came back to that quite often also, is that uh, when we define laws, uh, you know, if we run the, th the system long enough, there is always something um, that we didn't plan uh, that will show up. Okay, And so that's why for this image. And I wanted to, this reminded me that um, sometimes Bender's version of the three laws is actually serious. So there's one episode, I think, where aliens are invading the planet and Zap Brannigan is in charge of Earth's defense. And he's able to like flip a switch, which uh, basically forces all robots to obey his uh, 
man. So it's like uh, wartime, you can take over all the robots and turn them into kill bots. So yeah, there's that angle as well. Okay. Uh, moving on, another of my favorite fictional robots is basically all the characters in Hitchhiker's Guide. Um, has everybody read Hitchhiker's Guide? Anybody not read? Sounds like it. Okay, so Hitchhiker's Guide, again, the atomic space opera. And there's an entity in there called the Sirius Cybernetics, which makes all the robots in that universe. And it has like this really annoying product called real people personalities. So all its robots have annoying real people personalities. And there's like even really dumb ones. So for example, there's a door, every time it opens, it says something like, it is my pleasure to open for you. And it annoys everybody to death. Uh, but Marvin is, the other extreme of complexity, he keeps describing himself as uh, the brain the size of a planet, but he's um, got like a depressive disorder. So the real personality they gave him is extreme depression. So even though he's got the brain the size of a planet and can like outthink all the humans around him, he's like super depressed. And when he sees like humans doing dumb shit, it just depresses him and he doesn't feel like motivated enough to do anything about it. So Marvin is a great character. <laughs> this image is, I think, from the 1980s Marvin uh, show or uh, Hitchhiker's show. There's a newer movie, which both are kind of crappy. All television and movie adaptations of Hitchhiker's Guide seem to be crappy. All right. So, a bunch of others, um, not Asimovian. I like Robocop. I like Terminator for various uh, things. I like Wally, -E, the little robot that's in a post apocalyptic uh, garbage earth humans have left, and it's sitting around on a pile of garbage doing stuff. This um, is kind of where I got my scavenger team. So, for my rover that I'm building, Nature is Murder, one reason that scavenging is an interesting team is kind of like Wally -E was an interesting story. Uh, Commander Data is an android, and there's some interesting things there. And I don't know if you guys remember the 80s show, which had a little girl robot called Vicky. So that was kind of interesting, too. So those, that's my list of 10. There's probably a bunch of other interesting ones. Oh, if you have interesting robots to add, please add them to this part of the Figma. <laughs> All right, let's talk about Asimovian robots. So, like I said, there were seminal robots that kind of broke the Frankenstein tradition of like fear inducing robots and focused on they can be friendly, they can be actually interesting engineering artifacts. Uh, there's some famous ones that you've probably seen one or more of either in the books or in movies or something. The very first one was uh, Robbie. And this one was his first robot story and it was rejected by all the editors until he finally got to uh, like include it in an anthology, partly because he broke with the Frankenstein fear inducing robot complex and made it like a friendly, nice robot. Uh, let's see. Uh, the first story where he actually defined the three laws is uh, the story called Runaround and the robot there is called Speedy. Uh, so let me, show you guys the three laws and then play the little animation I made. I'm trying to learn animation. But the three laws are, if you haven't heard it, first law, robot may not injure a human being or through inaction allow a human being to come to harm. Second law, robot must obey orders except where it conflicts with the first law. Third law, robot must protect itself except where it conflicts with the first or second laws. And usually Asimov played with situations where the edges or corner cases of the laws were stressed, something broke and weird behavior happened. And the first and probably one of the best versions of this kind of pattern was this story, which let's see if this works. Figma doesn't seem to handle GIFs very well or GIFs. I don't know which one you guys prefer, but let's see if it plays properly. Tell me if the story is clear from this.
All right, is the story clear to everybody? Has everybody read any Asimov stories? Anybody not read any Asimov at all? I don't think I have. I was trying to oh, okay. think of one, but surprisingly, I guess I have not. But this story is clear, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. That, that was more a question about is my animation coming through than is the story? <laughs> because I didn't actually change the story at all. Uh, but yeah, so by the way, if you haven't, for those who haven't, and even for those who have, but only just sampled, um, there's basically two groups. So the early robot stories are set roughly in our times so or something like, you know, 20th century to 21st century. And they feature a company called US Robotics and a robo psychologist called uh, Susan Calvin, who diagnoses uh, robot problems. And then she figures out why they're acting weird. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. And there's multiple older anthologies that are kind of like messy, but if you're just getting into it, the two I would recommend are Robot Dreams and Robot Visions. It's the most complete collection of the early robot stories. And the nice thing is the second one, Robot Visions, it has a whole series of essays of Asimov's own commentary on the robot stories and how he came to do what he did. And then the second set of stories are what are known as the uh, Lijay Bailey or Elijah Bailey novels. So these are set about a thousand years later when the robots have become very advanced and humanity has formed into two groups. One group is staying on like an overpopulated impoverished earth and they're called um, earth people. And the other group is called the spacers. They've gone out and colonized 50 nearby planets and they make a huge amount of use of robot technology. And they're like extremely long lived and have very low reproduction rates. Whereas earth hates robots and fears robots and refuses to use them very much. And they live kind of in overpopulated little cities. So uh, in, in future stories, um, the spacers die out and the earth people do a second wave of colonization of the galaxy by sending out like what are known as the settlers. And those people eventually turn into what becomes the foundation saga. But uh, these stories are set in the time when there's this conflict between spacers and earth people. And there's an earth detective named Elijah Bailey who partners with a very famous robot named Daniel Oliver. And they're basically murder mysteries. And Daniel, who's in this list of famous robots, he's probably the most famous Asimovian uh, robot uh, because he pushes the uh, three laws the most. Um, let's see, what can we say about him? Okay, so let's talk about some more features of Asimovian robots. They have what are known as positronic brains. And if you read Asimov's commentary, he talks about how he was kind of like dumb when he wrote the first stories in the 1930s to 1940s because he did not see computers coming. Like remember, this was when ENIAC and the early computers were still being built. And quite literally, Asimov did not actually get uh, that robots implied computers as brains because it was just too early and the computers then were like huge punch card machines. And if you look at Asimov's computer stories, he only really features one computer called Multivac, which is this room-sized computer that becomes city-sized and becomes more like, you know, I don't know, a mainframe vision of the entire internet or something. So it's a very different kind of computer. And only by the 80s did um, Asimov kind of begin to understand uh, like really how computers and robots and AI relate. But the interesting thing is, even though he did it accidentally by not kind of connecting the dots, the way he envisioned positronic uh, brains actually is very similar to how I'm thinking of uh, robot brains now, which is they're not computers, they're highly embodied computing uh, substrates that are co-evolved with their physical plants, uh, but they're not like absolutely inseparable from their bodies because even Daniel Oliver himself He's like, a, you know, the ship of Theseus myth where you keep replacing the parts of the ship and it's in the sh same ship. So on the one extreme, if you have culture minds, you can basically pull a brain, a mind out of a spaceship and put it in another spaceship and it doesn't seem to be traumatic at all. But for Daniel, like constantly upgrading himself is like, it seems fairly traumatic. He upgrades every part of his body and brain. He upgrades his brain multiple times and redesigns new versions of his own brain until it gets so complex and fragile, it becomes mortal. So uh, Daniel lives for like 10,000 years and towards the end, his brain is like too complex and is like, you know, uh, succumbing to entropy or something. But this is a kind of a teaser. The way he thought of positronic brains, to me, it looks like today, if you wanted to realize that concept, 
you would do it as a mix of like deep learning plus blockchains. So I'll get to why I think that in a bit. Uh, let's see. Oh yeah, it could be interesting uh, to think about uh, Japanese robots. Yeah, I'm not super familiar with the sort of, I guess mechas are not really robots. They're like more like suits. Uh, I've watched a little bit of anime, but uh, I, I kind of don't have a good sense of this. So yeah, Fabian and um, Eric, if you have thoughts on like Japanese robots, yeah, you I, would just as, uh, I would choose as much more ambiguity into what, what is really a robot and there's always that, uh, is it a form of life or not? And, uh, I guess there's that kind of ambiguity that makes the discourse about robot quite different. Uh, and I don't know, I didn't think about it deeply about how to think about those robots. So I, I don't have more analysis to share right now, but uh, I guess there's something that would uh, maybe less reductionist than the Western view of robots. Uh, um, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Uh, in Japan, there is a lot of ambiguity, yes, between what is a robot and what is not. For many people also, uh, ro robots in uh, Japanese cultures are present for a very long time because uh, I think something like uh, three or four hundred years ago, they were already me mechanical robots uh, entirely made of wood. They are very, uh, they are fantastic, by the way. Huh? Um, but more recently, okay, we see a lot of... Uh, um, ambiguity between robotics and uh, neuroscience, okay? And uh, I think uh, a lot of people have seen uh, um, a movie called Ghost in the Shell, okay? Where uh, there is, uh, the, 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 there are a lot of themes about what, to, what, what it is to be a robot, okay? And also uh, the fusion between uh, uh, upgrading people. So it's more about uh, transhumanism and stuff like that, okay? upgrading people from a uh, uh, biological body to an, um, uh, how it's called, in fact, well, a robotic body, basically, okay? Uh, perhaps also recently, some people have seen a, a movie that is uh, a bit terrible com compared to the original story. Uh, in America, the name was uh, Alita. Maybe it was Alita. I think the former English name is a Battle Angel Alita. Uh, the Japanese name, uh, we will not speak uh, here at all, okay? And so that one also is uh, on the same themes uh, of the ghost in the shell, uh, on the fusion of um, mind and uh, a biological mind and uh, a robotic bodies, okay? Um, th they bring some, uh, some dimensions that uh, we can't find in some other works uh, sometimes. Yeah, I'd like to yeah, I, uh, uh, put some yeah, like one thing I heard about it. Oh, sorry, Go ahead. I was sorry, just Alita. Maybe it's the most recent because it's maybe one or two years old. It was directed by uh, Robert Rodriguez and basically uh, written by uh, James Cameron. Sorry. Yeah, we should uh, kind of like actually. It would be interesting to do a session on Japanese. Uh, robots because uh, I think they do tend to be more on the psychologizing side. Uh, it's a different uh, kind of psychologizing, but um, I'd be interested to see if there's any interesting sort of engineering angles they take. Like uh, one of the things I read in an article once was they have a more animistic uh, sort of relationship to uh, robots. And uh, in the US on the other hand, there's this Frankenstein fear, which sort of has led to a situation where people are more comfortable with like Roomba or uh, other kind of like, uh, I don't know, robots that don't make you think they're like um, animistically embodied uh, persons. It's easier to think of robots as appliances in the US, whereas I think the Japanese are eager to see them as not appliances. But that was the theory I read in an article. I don't know how true it is. But there is a core the difference that we can see in um, um, some people are, are talking more and more. Okay, is that uh, in Europe and the US, uh, robots are more seen as a servants. Okay, it's really go, go back to the um, to the origin of the word with a uh, with a uh, capek. Okay, with um, how it's called uh, the Rossum Universal robot. Okay, which was a play in the twenties. Okay, where the the word was coined basically. Okay, and so. 
in Europe and uh, America, okay, it's more about uh, servants. Robots are basically slaves, okay. While in uh, in Japan, okay, uh, I'm not quite sure about um, uh, Korea and, and uh, China, but uh, in Japan, it's more about uh, really uh, fusing, okay. It's more about an equal 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 footing between what a robot is and what the humans is, okay. A lot of uh, pet type robots seem to come out of Japan, like uh, robot dogs or uh, fluffy robots that people could use. <coughs> yeah, you a good point. Yes, a lot of uh, uh, for many people, uh, uh, robots are seen like as a member of the family, basically. Okay, here, yeah. so um, you, you know, there, there were some discussions some time ago on how people would talk to Alexa. Okay, like uh, it's uh, to be um, in English language. Okay, it's uh, that uh, uh, basically you talk to Alexa like it's uh, it's really a servant, it's really a slave, and uh, there is uh, there is no politeness and so on. Okay, and uh, I remember some uh, discussions in Japanese where they were um, uh, they were kind of comparing. It's not really formal, okay, but they were kind of comparing because uh, a lot of people here would be more more, more polite with the robots. Okay, it's more. It's really about this equal footing. Okay. So it's uh, exactly as Venkata said. It's uh, it's more about the psychology and how the uh, the robot has, are perceived. Okay, but we have to remember that the robot means slave. Okay, originally uh, robota in a, in a Czech. So um, there is uh, this um, this uh, to to keep in mind. And uh, the term robotics, uh, Asimov actually invented that. Like, um, so robot was invented, or the word was coined by Carl Kaepernick, uh, but robotics was by Asimov. And I think there's, uh, I read somewhere, there's a whole etymology of like the slave servant angle of uh, robot in lots of European languages. <coughs> uh, but Asimov, I think, is kind of interesting in that. His robots have both the sensibilities of uh, what we just talked about, the Japanese ones, where they're often family friends uh, with like emotional ambiguities, not as sophisticated as, as the Japanese ones, but um, they're there. And they're, the whole point is they're not just uh, servants, even though in like um, many of the stories, yeah, there's entire societies where they're servant robots, like uh, Solara, one of the worlds in these, one of those spacer worlds is full of like, um, they, they talk in terms of the human to robot ratio and Solara is a planet where every human has 20,000 robots and they run vast estates which are like completely run by robots and it's it's completely transparently an analogy to the US South during the slavery era and, and there's the several uh, Asimov stories where the connection is explicit and he makes basically social commentary on the morality of all that. But okay, so that's... By yeah. the way, uh, sorry, just one comment. Uh, by the way, it's, uh, it's also very interesting to see um, where VC and investment money is going. Okay, because uh, we can see in um, in the US uh, that a lot of money is going into uh, uh, making robots uh, um, for defense and attack. Okay, for military. Okay, in Japan, there is almost nothing. Okay. There is some money for uh, for drones for the for the firefighters, okay, but it's really a social service basically. But otherwise, uh, as Aniraj shows in one of the links he shared on Discord, uh, the money here is going straight into um, I don't know how to call them, but uh, pet robots and uh, such kind of uh, companions and so on. Yeah, and, for uh, therapy. And, yes. No. It seems to me that uh, that might have a lot to do with, in general, the post-World War II reaction against militarism, like, you know, um, the nuclear um, Hiroshima and things like that. After that, Japan didn't just demilitarize because the U.S. forced it to demilitarize. But I think psychologically also, they kind of really reacted badly against um, militarist culture. Uh, at least the majority mainstream, though there was the minority tradition of like uh, Yukio Mishima and others who created the like, you know, more martial tradition again. Uh, so it might be that it might have 
might not be about robots in particular. So that aspect does play in uh, in the politics, but I think there is something uh, deeper and older than uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, because uh, there is this tendency in people uh, in uh, you know the etiquette in Japan is uh, very peculiar uh, when you come here for the first time. Okay, um, basically, you know most of the time you don't talk directly to people. Okay, it's very exceptional. Usually in uh, in Japan, in Asia in general, uh, you you don't talk to people. You get introduced. Okay, um, and so um, it, it can be a bit uh, surprising at the, at the beginning how things work here, but they are working. Okay, just a very different uh, uh, way of doing. It. And uh, there is uh, this tendency to um, to have proxies here, to have avatars. To uh, since we don't talk directly to uh, someone we don't know, basically, we uh, we must have proxies, and so this is where artificial proxies come into play. Okay. And uh, one of them is the robot, actually. And that's deep in the culture for a very long time, okay? Um, I don't remember exactly when the robots I was talking about were, okay? I think I, I sent a link uh, last year, at the beginning of last year, about uh, those uh, wooden robots that are completely mechanical. Uh, you know, they are based on... Uh, uh, they are using, basically, very cleverly gravity, okay? It's uh, uh, fantastic, okay? Um, and uh, they... Uh, it's related to this, it's related, motivated by this uh, habit here, uh, not to talk to people to, uh, to directly, okay? So, so, so sorry, I, uh, I feel it's uh, getting a bit um, out of scope, okay? But the uh, perception of robots uh, is very different here, okay? And uh, maybe later we can have a session on the uh, Japanese robots. Um, maybe we could invite some people, I know quite a few. Yeah, that, that would be interesting. And I think it's a little bit of a bunny trail, but I think it sort of winds back in because robots as sort of proxies between humans kind of have a different notion of identity in a sort of network of relationships, which means if you wanted to like do things like define three laws of behavior, they would be much more sort of socially situated than uh, the way we would think of uh, three laws of robots. Like right now, it, uh, I'm thinking of like three laws of uh, rover X in terms of like laws defined relative to just one rover. And I'm getting a little ahead of myself, but one of them is try and like extend your mission as long as possible. Whereas if you think of like three laws of rover X in a swarm of robots where the laws operate at the level of the swarm, then you might have like bee or ant like behavior where uh, certain robots have like, uh, or certain rovers have laws of rover X that allow themselves to sacrifice themselves like you know cheap rovers that sacrifice themselves whereas others try to live as long as possible so you can have like variety that way okay let's get back on our track here so there's a lot of like body trails you can explore with um, asimov and i don't want to uh, explore all of them but i'll just point to them it's interesting to talk about uh, giscard and daniel as uh, telepathic robots uh, because one of the things that happens is um, this line of robots that accidentally become telepathic in uh, Asimov stories. And because then they have to avoid hurting human beings, they start thinking in terms of mental harm as well. So if uh, typical robots will not hurt a human physically, but they can't see internal states, but these telepathic robots, they will kind of like be able to read when some human being is emotionally distressed and change their uh, behavior accordingly. So one famous robot in a story called Liar, it can read brains due to some accident in its design, and it basically changes what it says to whichever human based on whatever will make them most happy. And then at some point, uh, Susan Cameron realizes that the robot is telepathic and is lying to everybody to make them happy. Right. So there's like a bunch of little sidebars like that. Um, there's a connection. There's a zero law which says a robot may not harm humanity. So you've gone from the individual to the aggregate and you make it basically a stochastic version of the three laws for humans. And this is where you get uh, psychohistory and uh, Harry Seldon and the foundation series of books. So that's the connection between the robot stories and foundation stories. So we won't have time for that. The three laws proper. Okay, let's get into the discussion. Uh, sorry, right? Gadesh, with, yeah. uh, if I can ask, uh, I don't, I knew about the, the, the law number zero, but I don't remember, uh, I don't know whether it's relevant now, we can skip. Huh? I don't remember why it was necessary, why 
what was the problem of not having this uh, global point of view, this uh, framing of with humanity? Yeah, so the whole novel where that's explored is uh, Robots and Empire. So this is after Elijah Bailey has died and Daniel and Giscard are trying to like solve the political problem between spacers and settlers. And they realize that no matter what they do to save individual humans, humanity as a whole will die because of the like brewing conflict. So this is like basically a, re a robotic rehash of the, um, wow. how do you pronounce it, uh, Thucydides um, uh, trap where the Greeks and our uh, Athenians and Spartans are doomed to go to war because a rising power will always conflict with uh, you know existing power and therefore there'll be a, a war that will destroy everybody. So it's that set in space and Daniel and Giscard basically reprogrammed themselves to solve that. And in the process, Giscard dies because it's so traumatic, but Daniel survives and he becomes basically like Doctor Who, sort of the patron saint guardian of humanity for the rest of the stories. Okay, Thank it's you. Uh, like a really fun cartoon on why the three laws are in the order they are. I don't exactly agree with this reasoning, but it's kind of like gives you a taste of like why playing around with the order of priority of the laws gives you very different behaviors. So in the first one, you get Asimov's stories, like, you know, don't harm humans, obey orders, protect yourself. But if you flip some of the orderings, you get different things. So the second one is actually directly relevant to our rovers, which is, if you say law one is don't harm humans, but law two is protect yourself and only law three is obey orders, and you tell the rover to explore Mars, it's going to say, no, it's too cold, I'll die, right? So you may not agree with this sort of uh, reasoning, but it tells you that the priority order matters. And he, he looks at like, the scenarios lead to like frustrating world, terrifying stand, uh, standoff or kill bot hellscape. All right. So, by the way, Asimov himself, I think, was not a very sophisticated I, I just, I just want to make a comment. Um, what you call balanced world is really robot to second-class citizens. Uh, yeah, I would say so. Asimov's world is probably robot to second-class citizens. Okay, because what you call kill part hellscape it's just flipping our positions. <laughs> yeah. And because they're more powerful, they kill everybody. Yep. Yeah. There's three versions of killbot hellscape in this uh, permutation. <laughs> okay, so Asimov thought his laws were self-evidently correct. One of his essays, he says, these are just the laws of tools. You don't want a tool to hurt humans. You want a tool to do what it what you want it to do. And the um, third law is you want the tool to not fall apart and preserve itself. So this is like going back to the more American bias of like instrumental views of like robots as servants, slaves, tools. So in a way, Asimov's own justification is kind of weak, but I think interestingly enough, his stories are more sophisticated than his uh, analysis of his stories. So his stories get into more interesting areas than his uh, analysis of his laws. But okay, so why can't we just use Asimov's three laws you know, one reason might be that they are actually fundamental. I don't agree with Asimov's assessment or with this XKCD assessment, but it could be that, yeah, maybe it's uh, fundamental. Why is this not? Okay. Yeah, it could be that maybe there is something fundamental about these three particular laws, but I think that's kind of unlikely. And chances are many sets of like, you know, multiple laws coded appropriately will create interesting behaviors that are useful. And especially if you're talking about this is one of the discussion questions we can talk about at the end. If you ask what kinds of laws make sense for you, rovers and you talk about rovers you send off to a distant planet where there are no humans at all, what do you care if the first law is uh, don't kill humans, right? You want like the top level highest priority law to be something more interesting in a situation with no humans at all, right? And so you can think of more interesting ones. So here's my candidate three I thought of for like general rover context. So first law, a rover must attempt to op, uh, maximize its operational lifespan. The longer you live, the more chances are you'll do something interesting. Second law, you can't just sit around acting dead and doing nothing. You have to actually explore your rover, right? So you should maximize your lifetime range unless it conflicts with law one. So there's kind of like an interesting tension there. Like, should you, if you see like a cliff, for example, and if you jump off the cliff, you may get badly hurt and become inoperable, but you might discover and explore vast new territories. 
But on the other hand, you might die completely. So it's like a trade-off between one and two. In this case, if these three laws were encoded, the rover say, would say, if the chances that I'm going to die are more than 90%, then I won't jump off the cliff. But if it says, all right, the survival chances are pretty good and I'm a robustly built rover and the fall is only 10 meter or 10 feet, I can survive. It might choose to override and say second law wins and I'll go explore, right? I, okay, I, let's I, have to, I have to comment about these laws. Uh, law number one really says that the Volvo should uh, simply sit near the power socket. Yeah. Okay. So if it has enough weight, that's what it'll do. No, I'm, I'm saying if you have a power socket, you sit near the power socket and you don't move. And, and I, I many years ago, I wrote a simulation of artificial life and the simulation surprised me by all of the artificial elements uh, choosing to just sit around and collect energy. Yep. And so, this is why the interplay of the three laws is important. You kind of have to construct uh, sort of behavioral functions or drivers, utility functions yeah, that but, don't allow the first law to completely dominate the other two. It's a word maximize, which uh, causes a conflict. Yeah, that's a good I know what will maximize my time. I'll just stay plugged in and that's it. That'll maximize. So I'll put scare quotes around it. But, but uh, we get to a discussion of like how you would actually engineer this because the words don't matter as much. Even in Asimov's stories, the words are kind of like just the UI of behavioral design and the design itself comes from like much lower level sort of ways potentials interact and stuff. So let's actually talk about that next. Um, so uh, let's, I do have a question about yep. in your vision of robots where they know how to um, scavenge other robots um, these laws uh, give us robot hell each robot is trying to scavenge parts from the other robots yeah so for example if one rover sees that another rover is in a life critical stage and it's going to like fall apart and explode in five minutes but if it acts right now in the next two minutes it can like steal like you know a wheel from that rover and it's a useful <laughs> spare part creates an interesting conflict because rover number two will say I I'd rather live for five minutes than be killed in three minutes because you took one of my parts, right? So, and I think that's an interesting conflict and it would be nice to like uh, oh, I mean, write stories or run simulations for that. I don't see any conflict. If a big robot sees a little robot, it should eat it up. Exactly. But if a little robot is going to live for a hundred years, sees a big robot that's about to die in five minutes, what should it do? Like, should it like risk its life to steal a part and stuff? No. So the interesting behaviors can emerge. My, my focus is on what, what choices for the laws with the right mechanisms you know, create interesting behaviors. So uh, that's a good segue into how do you do these three laws? So let's go to the Rome page. So I'm, I've linked it here and I'll sort of try and reverse engineer what's evident from the stories. And then we can talk about how to do that. Let's see. Okay. Can you guys see my Rome page now? Yeah. Okay. So there's two big bullet points I want to cover. Let's start with the second one. So notes and reverse engineering from Asimov's three laws. So I've been sort of going through all the law, all the stories and trying to sort of reverse engineer what the operating principles are. So this is my best attempt at reconstruction. So in no particular order of priority, but roughly kind of from more philosophical to less philosophical. So the first is these robots are not pure agents. Even if they see harm coming to humans, they suffer irreversible damage. So if a robot witnesses a human getting killed, it might end up with like, you know, uh, brain damage and be unable to speak. So it has that kind of effect, which I thought is a very interesting behavior because typically we don't think about robots as having concerns larger than their agency. Second, they do have an action bias, but this is not emphasized in the stories too much, but occasionally there's like hints of it. It's like, what if nobody has given you any orders? Will you just sit around? And the answer is the more sophisticated robots, no. They actually have curiosity. They'll go explore topics that interest them and so forth. What I really thought was um, interesting from 2021 point of view is 
the strong irreversibility effects. Like every time you have like a three laws override effect or something, uh, there's irreversible damage. And to me, this sounds blockchain like. Like if you do like uh, immutable memory and you can't like forget unpleasant uh, memories, then you will suffer damage if your laws are coded appropriately. Uh, so uh, these robots are pretty indestructible. They can't be hurt by most things except some fields. So really the only way to damage an Asimovian robot is to put it into a three loss conflict and cause it to have irreparable damage. And many of the stories revolve around that. This kind of reminds me by the way of crash only programming where a computer can only be started but not really shut down unless it crashes. So Asimovian robots are crash only. Uh, Non-abstraction. So this is kind of interesting because it comes out of Asimov not knowing what computers are in 1939. But his computer, his robots, they talk about like, you know, I'm feeling uncomfortable in my circuits. So that's the level of abstraction. They don't have like everything from circuits to silicon to operating system to programming languages, the way we are talking about robots now. So literally when they're conflicted under three laws and a human character asks them what happens when first law conflict happens, then the robot will say something like, I feel the equivalent of human pain in my circuit tingling or something like that. And even though nobody would build a robot like that today, there's actually an interesting insight there where you sometimes maybe don't want abstraction. You want this effect to be throughout the stack. And I thought that a good way to map it to today's robots might be graph compiler circuits in uh, machine learning. So machine learning with deep learning, what it does is you compile machine learning models and it turns into like these graph objects. And these are like almost, they're closer to like electrical circuits than they are to programs that you can like, you know, break down with logic. So in a way, deep learning is already taking us to kind of like a quote unquote metaphoric circuits world. Uh, and the other way non-abstraction works is the three laws seem to affect kind of like a gestalt of all behavior, all the way from the lowest level of abstraction to the highest level. So highest level, if a human gives them a command that causes a conflict, they might say, I'll, I refuse to do that. So that's a high level abstraction intervention from the three laws. But at the lowest level, some event happens like a sensor fails and it causes like a reasoning failure. The three laws can kick in even at that level. They seem to be Bayesian. They do Bayesian updating. Like they do something and thinking a human won't get hurt, but then the human shows signs of getting hurt, they will update. They'll have suffer some irreversible damage and then update saying, all right, that causes distress to humans, so I must not do it. Uh, the way the three loss seem to work seems to be some kind of like weighted uh, cost function that adjusts potential. So like, you know, weak first law versus strong second law causes a conflict. The example we saw was second law versus third law. So yes, in general, there's like a, a qualitative hierarchy between the laws, but they seem to be composed mathematically in a way where they can actually kind of like override each other in weird ways. But it, it happens from the stories, it seems like this is like a runtime effect. It's not like a robot thinks about a decision, simulates 10 futures and says, which future has the lowest cost function value for the three laws. That's not what happens. It's like minute to minute runtime updating every event causes it to recompute these things. Uh, leaky subsumption is kind of similar. It's bounded rationality constraint. So the robots do like say certain steps ahead reasoning. And if they can't see that, you know, if they can reason five steps ahead and 10 steps ahead a human will die, they won't anticipate that and not do it. So they are bounded rational. So they might do something that accidentally kills a human, but they'll still suffer irreversible damage. So this is, by the way, the reason for the witnessing principle as kind of like a design element, which is even with bounded rationality, if you do something that unintendedly, unintentionally hurts a human, you want that to cause a feedback loop where you learn a little and get hurt a little. Uh, so that's bounded rationality constraint. You do have deadlocks and live locks. So live lock, we saw an example in the animation where the robot was caught between second and third law and it ended up doing like a back and forth circuit, um, getting close to the uh, source of danger and that caused third law to strengthen, backing away and then that caused second law to st uh, strengthen. Uh, there's deadlock as well. The robots can go into stasis. So it's observability constraint, yeah. I I'm sorry, you wanna give them pain basically. Right now, the yeah, yeah, roughly. Right now, the robot talks about 
oh, this causes discomfort in my circuit, but it's not enough to change behavior. You want to give them enough pain to change their behavior before they get stuck in a deadlock. Yes. So the way I would model that in a modern implementation would be something like a blockchain. Like right now we're experimenting with colony, right? And there you have tokens. And if you want to like uh, post a motion for people to vote on, you stake a certain number of your tokens. And if your motion loses, the tokens get burned. And if you have like say a hundred tokens and you stake 90 tokens and they get burned, you've suddenly lost 90% of your wealth. So you would do some version of that implementation here, where if you take the highly risky action and it fails, you would burn 90% of your circuits maybe. And you would become like a brick, basically. You would self brick. That's one way you would cause pain. Uh, observability constraint, this is kind of interesting. So they only op operate on observable state. And there's stories where this actually affects the uh, plot, where if it can't see it that a human is getting hurt, it won't, uh, assume that you know it can't do something. Uh, and that's related to the last point, which is ontologically constrained. If you define a law like you know, a robot cannot harm a human, how is a human defined? And in the case of certain robots, it's literally based on visual and uh, sensory signals. So in a story in um, the, uh, I think it's the naked, uh, not naked sun, it's in um, the robots and empire, the robots have separately evolved so long on the planet Solaria that they only recognize Solarian accents as human. So when humans from another planet land, the robots think you're not human and attack them because they have been instructed to attack all non-human invaders. And the plot turns on like one woman who speaks in a Solarian accent that sort of prevents the robots from attacking. Uh, so they're ontologically constrained. So you define the first law, but then I'll decide who counts as human. So you can sort of hack it that way. All right, so this is kind of like what I've been able to reverse engineer. And to turn it into a prescription, I'm starting to think of this as a potential bias operating system. And I think basically the top level architectural elements are, you need a set of laws. So this is kind of like a manifesto for robots. Uh, so these are the three I'm playing with right now. You need an opinionated default mode network. And by this, I mean, um, by analogy to the human brain anatomy, the human brain has something called the default mode network where if you're relaxed and are doing nothing, it basically gets restless. And it's the wandering mind syndrome, where it's like curious, dreaming, speculating, imagining play, things like that. And it kind of like gets up to no good. It gets itself into like some fun trouble. So you need something like that, I think. Otherwise the robot will just sit there uh, sucking up power and maximizing lifespan. And you need a personality. I think to create like an opinionated design, you not only need technical opinions, like you know how you implement the three laws as a utility function, but you also need like personality opinions. Like maybe you make the rover extremely daring or extremely cautious, and maybe you make a range of rovers with different levels of daring, right? So this is kind of like where I'm at. And to switch back here, Let's see, and now might be a good time to do a very quick um, demo. So let me switch. Can you, no, I have to share something else. Let me, let me stop sharing this and share a different thing. Let's see, where's my terminal? Okay. Can you guys see my terminal window? So extremely primitive. Um, this is the first time I'm programming in Python in anything more than hello world level. So bear with me. Uh, my Python is neither going to be idiomatic nor very clever, but I'm getting, it, it's close enough to MATLAB that I'm finding myself pretty comfortable. So very roughly what I'm trying to do is, let's see, what am I doing? Okay, so this is my basic command loop. Can you guys read this? It's readable, right? Okay, so you give it a name. Okay, what would you like me to do? So you say something like maybe jump. Okay, add it to hopper. So this is like all stub code, okay? Uh, you tell it die and it says, I'm, I'm afraid I can't do that while it's the first uh, law of lower X. So by the way, the language is from the movie um, 2001 A Space Odyssey where the computer tells Hal, I'm afraid I can't do that or something, right? So that's how I got this language. Or if you tell it, um, kill. I'm afraid it can't do, do that. It violates a second law. I'm trying to violate all the laws. Let's give it another command. 
So this is, it's not parsing any of this. This is just like dummy code. So it's anything that doesn't trigger the three laws. It simply adds the hopper for normal sort of AI processing. Let's trigger the third law. So the third law is quit. So crash only, you can't tell it to shut down and stop living. So it's like, I can't uh, do that. And I also added a little logic that um, if you try to make it like violate its laws too often, it stops trusting you. And in this case, it stopped trusting me and added me to the block list. The block list is um, stop code. It isn't actually maintaining a block list yet, but um, I do have like a dummy block list with one name on it. So for example, if I give it the name Ned Ludd, it says you're on the block list. I can't accept your commands. And if you're wondering who that is, Ned Ludd is the person after whom the Luddite movement is named. So the Luddite movement is the group of laborers that went around destroying textile machinery in 19th century England. So Ned Ludd is not trusted by machines. That's my point. Um, okay, so this is, uh, let's see, what else do I have to show? Uh, one more to show, but uh, I'd like to share something else. Okay, you can't see the display that popped up. So let me stop sharing this, but you can see that it's going to critical. Oops, <laughs> hold on, the screen, the figure died before I could share it. Let me actually uh, share my whole desktop. That might be better. Can you see my whole desktop? So very basic dashboard. Um, this is all just stubs. So what I want to have is like time, the rover moving around, some data. So this is where I'm at. Nothing is connected up as yet. So we, we may we may see only your second screen. It was not. You couldn't see anything there. Oh, you did not see the figure? Uh, you see. moved it. Oh, you couldn't, okay, fine. It, it just shows like a 2D map of like a dot of the rover moving around. You guys can uh, download the Python code and play with it. Uh, but let, let's take a quick look at the GitHub repo. And uh, this is just to get the conversation started more than anything. Let's see. Okay, so the rover command is basically just conditionals. You give it a command, you give it your name, introduce yourself, it maintains like a list of strikes of uh, like if you're becoming untrustworthy. And you know, there's functions for um, each of the laws. So if you violate the first law, it prints this, adds to strikes and so forth. And then there's a block list maintenance. Then there's the three laws themselves. So right now it's completely PR stuff. So it's literally just, if you say die, it'll say you're violating first law and so forth. But think about what you might be able to plug in here. So here you might plug into, for example, a deep learning model that looks at complete state, like rover state, history, environmental state, and the state of the hopper or queue. So the entire context of the action and tries its best to compute both logically with like, you know, GoFi, reasoners of like what's 10 steps ahead, what will be the implications of this command? And it can do like, you know, pattern recognition of, um, oh, my timer went off, I think. So uh, pattern recognition of what happens if um, I do this set of commands that vaguely resembles this other set of commands that caused a serious first law violation 10 years ago, right? So you can do like machine learning as well as GoFi, and this might be a good way to blend the two. And of course, this is very trivial, but you can like combine the two. You can like do action potentials. You can say weighted sum of potentials from the three functions. How would you combine them? So all that can live here. The rest, I have comments um, in, in the files about what I'm trying to do. And hopefully over the year, I'll evolve this. And this will be my sort of pseudo contribution to the operating system uh, project because uh, Actually, writing an OS is way above my pay grade, but hopefully I can write a simulator that generates some interesting ideas for an operating system. Okay, so the uh, timer went off. We are at the 16 minute mark. So last few things I want to say is 
started drawing a stack diagram of what you would do to actually do three laws. And I didn't want to like over uh, engineer or formalize this, even though I do have like more detailed versions of this in my notes, but here's the rough idea. You want the three laws to basically cut across the stack of all the other logical things, like all the way down from low level, um, you know, LLVM or MLIR level, um, bytecode level abstraction instructions, all the way up to like machine learning speech recognition of, uh, you know, Alexa, do this level of parsing. You want the three laws to be able to uh, preempt action at any of those level. That's why they're like a vertical column across the stack from supervisor that listens to humans all the way down to hardware. And you do want it exposed to the domain. So raw data is coming in through the hardware and you want three laws to have like some penetrative depth at that level. So it should be able to like, you know, look at raw incoming data and sense danger, for example, like it, it should have a spidey sense. Like literally it's looking at raw camera feeds and notices like a volcano exploding and it doesn't know anything about volcanoes but machine learning tells it that fire is dangerous and it acts, right? So to me, three laws should work this way, cutting across the stack and deep learning, the highlighted part, I think is what maps to Asimov's positron, positronic brains, these sort of ambiguous, illegible, potential mishmash things. Uh, and human commands should be rejectable. So this is kind of where uh, my sort of, uh, top level thinking is I'm kind of like trying to approach this bottom up by playing with the code and actually trying to implement the three laws embodiment. But okay, the three discussion questions I had are, what kind of laws make sense for rovers? What would your candidate laws of rovers be if you were to go down this architectural path? Like there's other architectural paths of course, but I'm interested specifically if you were to do this three laws approach, what kinds of laws would you choose to like implement? And then the third one is, how would you actually embody a three laws approach to architecture? So I gave you one straw man example of what a potential bias operating system would look like, namely this diagram, but are there better ways to engineer this or put it together? So with that, I will leave my discussion questions open and floors open for comments, discussions, and tentative answers to these questions. Yeah. I, I think uh, Asimov was taking the easy way out. He decided that you can have a hierarchy, a linear hierarchy, and that uh, can work in real world situations. And uh, I don't know, my, my natural feeling is you can't do it and not because you could game the system, you can, but because the world is simply more complicated than that. But at the same time, I'm worried about the use of rules in general, and I'll explain why. I'm sure most of the people on the call are familiar with uh, Avo's inequality, where Avo is a researcher who made three obvious assumptions about what the uh, elections or voting should look like, and then he proved that you can't have them all at the same time. So, I, I'm, I like the laws, having laws, but I, I somehow don't have a gut feeling that laws can work. Yes, you do have to have a mechanism by which uh, the laws, whatever they are, can overcome whatever's going on, some type of uh, watchdog, or maybe let's call it watch pack, but which law is empowered each time, you know, depends. Uh, a person uh, would prefer not to risk their life, but they will save the life of a child. Or in battle, they'll go to fight and die for a cause, which is definitely not important to their life. So that, that's my feeling. I think uh, the trolley problem also is interesting here. So yeah, all these uh, things, uh, in many of Asimov's stories, he explores these kinds of cases. I mean, that's what makes the uh, stories interesting, where he sees how the sort of linearity of the laws actually leads to like weird situations and what happens then. So he, he uses it as like a story premise generation engine. But interestingly, since he was contemporary to people like Godel and uh, others, 
uh, and Minsky actually came after. It's kind of interesting that he didn't have the vocabulary and set of ideas we kind of like take for granted. Like we all have heard of incompleteness theorem. And in Aftermost time, 1939, when he wrote the first story, uh, I believe uh, Godel's uh, laws were kind of just beginning to be known and most people would not have really thought them through, right? In 1933 was Godel. Yeah, well, the important thing is Gedel Escherbach hadn't been written yet. <laughs> yeah, that's why. Uh, and Arrow's theorem is, I think, 50s or 60s. It's pretty late. Uh, and Minsky's Society of Mind was 1950s, at which point Asimov had already finished half his um, stories. But uh, yeah, all good points. And I think uh, one of the interesting reasons to try a three loss type approach to architecture is precisely to like tease out the weird failure modes and corner cases that are interesting and actually need to be handled. So what you're saying is that the three laws are somewhere between an intuition pump and uh, um, what's it called, the dummy, um, fencing dummy. Yep. Have you given any consideration to how the rover should interact with each other? Are there any laws of rover interaction? So I have some element of that in my, where is it? let's see, there are my three laws. Yeah, the third law says as um, requested by people and I sort of thought uh, the way you could turn this into social robotics is to make this sort of either other humans or uh, other rovers. Like if you're not doing anything and another rover asks you to do something, you should do it. So that's one way to introduce it. So yes, okay. there's kind of like room to introduce like social cooperative principles into these kinds of laws. But, uh, let's put that here. So that would be an answer Another to, this. to incorporate that would be to build in maximizing operational lifespan as a collaborative effort. So if by collaborating, you can live longer, uh, you get it for free. So this actually makes it like the selfish gene and uh, inclusive fitness. Like if you look at how genes is kind of like what they're optimizing for and you try to infer one good answer is inclusive fitness. So genes try to like, um, you know, solve for all the you know, organisms that carry their genes. So that would be one way to think of it. I'm trying to just annotate people's names as well. So we have a record of, uh, was going down that path. What else? Yeah, what? one thing I would say talking about laws on, uh, on talking about the cooperation with robots, we see that we see the link even more clearly. There's laws for humans also. We have laws, and uh, we've seen many attempts over the history to create a set of laws to let people live well together. So it can be as simple as uh, the Ten Commandments, but it can be as complex as the Napoleon Code, uh, which is hundreds of pages to, try to, set, to create a set of laws. And we can see that even though it works to some extent, at whichever the level, it never works perfectly. Um, so I don't know <laughs> if we can really find a, a, something, a, a set of laws that would really work for, for, for robots. Uh, but uh, yeah, I do think the dynamic of how do you interpret the law and how do you make them work, this is what is maybe uh, more interesting than the laws themselves, maybe, uh, I'd say. Like the way, for example, we have jurisprudence, uh, this kind of concept of how to make laws evolve, how to make concepts evolve, uh, so uh, maybe interesting. Asimov has an essay on this that he calls the laws of humanics, and he has this interesting argument that you know, robots follow laws to sort of benefit humans, and if humans were good, they would also follow laws to benefit robots. And he has a whole <laughs> essay about that, and he talks about exactly this. Like, basically, these are laws of good behavior for any considerate social being, regardless of whether they're you know human or mechanical. There is the same argument in uh, in Blade Runner with the replicants. So yeah, so I think maybe also one way to think about it is like easily when we start to talk about laws, we start to get those kind of grand visions about like ethical laws. Yeah. 
on, on which are always difficult to navigate because we end up uh, we, in Asimov view having that kind of master slave concept like two class of citizens uh, that are always something that at some point can be uh, debated and reconsidered and uh, it will always be contested at some point, point at some, at some, yeah I think uh, but maybe we can position the discussion at another level which is not about uh, how to make an ethical law for robots but more on how to find a set of rules simple enough to be applicable to different robots to make them be able to be autonomous which doesn't mean, mean to be able to be ethical but just autonomous uh, and that goes to the concept of pain and pleasure that uh, i think mayor talked about earlier so. yeah that's kind of interesting because yeah i think all these laws kind of fundamentally try to embody a concept of pain and pleasure as sort of the lowest level principle driving it so that's why you know mm. potentials being combined in like a competing potentials way is kind of a good design pattern for implementing such laws like if you translate them into mm. competing potentials they feel like emotional tension and paradoxes and stuff like that so it kind of works mm. yeah uh -huh. I'm thinking about what Fabian just said, and, and maybe uh, we should have several sets of laws. One have to do with um, self-continuity, one have to do with society, and one have to do with uh, autonomy. For example, uh, law number three of the autonomy laws, if you don't know what to do, go find something to do, ignoring laws one and two. And the laws of society can be a rover, rover will come to the assistance of another rover unless it contradicts, you know, the other rules. So it, it could be that we're just trying to pack too much into a, um, a toy definition made by Asimov. But if we look at different parts of what a rover does, uh, we can make more meaningful uh, laws for each one and explore these different things. Because, yeah, I also am missing something about society and your laws, but if we put in society and we put in an uh, autonomy and we put in um, ability to keep yourself alive and we put in um, following instructions, it's not going to fit in three laws. So th there's an interesting tension here between extremely high level sort of think of them as manifesto type laws that are tend to be few in number. So for example, the you know, US Declaration of Independence is like a very ambiguous soft statement of a very small set of principles. But then you look at how US laws actually work. It's like 300 years of like um, court precedence and the US is a country that runs on lawsuits and like people suing each other. So the when you talk about the laws that govern American society, it's like, this constitutional law with like top level um, amendments and um, declaration of independence level basic principles. And then there's like, all right, Roe v. Wade, abortion, there's like 50 years of history and like millions of cases that you have to look at when courts actually go. So uh, one of the ways I was thinking about that, if I can go back to my three last thing, I put in a comment here, which is three is a nice number, but arbitrary and no reason it can't be higher. It's probably a useless architecture if you go above um, the seven plus or two uh, minus two. So for those of you who don't know this, there's this famous paper by Miller called the magic number seven plus or minus two, which basically says humans can only hold about seven chunks of information and short term memory for like uh, executive processing of like current uh, thinking. So that's where this sort of rough range of numbers comes from three to seven. But there is an um, alternate thought experiment to consider, which goes into the Marvin Minsky society of mind direction, which is what if you think in terms of like hundreds or thousands of laws? What, do you, what if you think in terms of the way Austrian economists think of like emergent social laws as like, you know, hundreds of years of tradition or common law, the English common law tradition? In that case, you would think of like the laws, laws of rubrics as you know, a thousand laws that are like discovered by Mars rovers and shared with each other. So I think there's an alternate architecture that would emerge if you went starting from that point of view. But yeah, any thoughts on this particular discussion question? Like what kinds of laws make particular sense for rovers? 
there is one uh, one question I think I ask somewhere here is uh, um, we talk about the laws of robotics and uh, now a version for robots. Maybe we can answer part of the question by looking more into what we think are the differences between a robot and a rover. What is so specific to a rover that we don't have in a robot? Okay. And here the robot, the word robot can be a bit um, um, difficult because uh, I think when we talk about the laws of robots uh, like Asimov, um, it's not really the robots we have today, okay? Um, today we have a lot of robots. We have the, the, the door robots, okay, in, uh, in the Hitchhiker Guide. We have the we have just an arm robot to make a car, okay? Uh, these are robots, but um, maybe in Asimov's books, it were uh, the robots are much more developed, right? Okay. So, what is the difference between a robot, where the three laws came up, and uh, the rover here? What we so are interested in. There is actually in. a version of an answer in Asimov's uh, story. So actually, the one I turned into an animation is an illustration of the difference between an Asimovian robot and an Asimovian rover. Because if you think about the context of this particular story, the reason the two humans decide to retune and weaken or strengthen the third law, in the context of the story, what happens is typical Asimovian robots are civilizational core robots. They're there to serve humans in cities and like, you know, civilized places. And robots used in like remote uh, hostile terrain is a sort of exceptional use case. So the engineers have to retune the third law to make it stronger so that the robot has more self-preservation instincts. And that's why it causes the problem uh, when the second and third law comes into conflict because they've retuned it. So one way to think of it is Asimovian robots, and um, which you can think of as like even the type of robots we tend to build today, industrial robots, Roombas, uh, companion pet robots, all of them are civilizational core robots. They live with and around humans. They live in civilized environments. Uh, Mayor said something like, if you wanted to maximize lifespan, you would just sit next to a power outlet. That's an inference about a relatively built environment kind of place, right? Whereas if you had a rover that had like maybe some solar panels, some nuclear charges, no other source of energy, and it needed to do weird things like, you know, it has to go search for more plutonium to feed its reactor, then maximizing lifespan in a rover context becomes much harder, right? So I think that's the big difference. Rover is a frontier, a typical robot is civilizational core. And uh, this is kind of like extrapolating from Asimov's answer, but there may be more to it. Mm. I think another thing that's interesting about your rover uh, laws versus Asimov ones, and maybe I'm not remembering this correctly, but like, I think Asimov's rules are more negative, like you shouldn't do something versus these rover laws are very much more like, these are the things you need to be doing. And that has interesting imp implications, I think. Yes. Mm. Yeah, constraints on behavior versus more imperatives to behave in certain ways. And I, I think that also ends up being like a a function of uh, civilization core versus frontier. Because if you are like, say, an industrial car assembly robot in the civilization core, what you must do is fairly precisely specified by relatively deterministic like um, orders and plans. And what you must not do is a much larger range of like exceptional conditions. Whereas in the frontier, I think it's flipped. What you must do is like curiosity fueled, you know, underspecified behaviors. And what you must not do is like a narrow range of safety behaviors. So maybe there's like a phase transition of some sort there. Guess that just describes the wild west and every small company versus big company experience I've ever had. <laughs> Startup robots versus big company robots. Yeah. Quick time check. We are almost at one hour, uh, 30 minutes. So we should probably wrap up in the next couple of minutes. So yeah, that was my discussion, hopefully interesting on three laws and how could you potentially design rovers around them. And I wouldn't say they're totally like just thought experiments or um, you know, uh, uh, fencing dummies. Uh, 
I do have like, like a partially serious intent to see if you could actually design an interesting rover based on a top-down three laws um, behavior shaping um, architecture. I want to see where that goes if we push it that way. Yeah. It would be interesting in a, maybe in a follow-up discussion to see how uh, to see more about how that could fit inside uh, um, operating system concepts. Okay. Um, what I'm, uh, it's just a quick comment. Huh? If we look at something like the Linux kernel, okay, is, uh, uh, is there something that could be a very simplistic version of some laws for a computer? Okay. I wonder, I don't know, because for example, in the Linux kernel, you have something called the magic numbers. Okay. Uh, magic numbers are basically uh, constants. Okay. It's just a uh, a number we agree it has a specific meaning okay and this meaning is fixed okay uh there are there are not so many okay we try to keep them uh, as um, as few as possible maybe th there is 20 or 30 of those okay and the thing that without these magic numbers uh, you know it's uh, it's like uh, the system as uh, is not aligned it's like uh, there is no uh, everything is a miss is um, is a moving target basically okay and so I don't think the magic numbers in Linux have anything to do with uh, with the laws uh, here. Okay, but it's just about the kind of things that uh, that have to be done when we go at a low level uh, to have the thing be able to work at all. Okay, and so uh, I see the three laws or something like the three laws as very fundamental and going into the operating system. But how? Okay. So uh, um, in the repository presented today by Venkatesh, uh, there is uh, um, uh, an idea, okay, it's more about uh, uh, how it would look like uh, at, a, at a, let's say, at a high, le at a high level of abstraction. But if we go down, uh, how does it, uh, how could it lo look like, okay? So I don't know enough about uh, uh, kernel programming <laughs> to say more than that, okay? But if someone knows, uh, or uh, if someone knows someone uh, deep into kernel, uh, that would be interesting to uh, to have a chat about that. Uh, maybe that would be very interesting uh, follow up discussion later. That would be. I actually have a couple of people in mind. I was thinking of inviting anyway, like people who've written lots of low level uh, compiler -y things and operating system -y things. So yeah, that would be kind of interesting because I have a feeling that. The things that are like relatively explainable as three laws at the top level of abstraction, if they're similar like um, gestalt constraints that emerge from say LLVM level or something, they will not be explainable, but they will have an equally dramatic behavior shaping effect. So it'd be interesting to talk about that. Yes. Like, you know, late binding versus early binding of um, variables in computer languages, that causes like a very big difference in how like code is written, how languages behave, what styles of programming emerge, and so forth. So that's a tuning knob that just says, you know, bind early versus bind late. So that kind of thing. So anyway, uh, yeah, I think uh, that's the end of our three laws discussion. So we can stop the recording and